Welcome to episode 33 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. This month, I had the honor to speak to Dr. Shanina Bomaiwema. She's a renowned scholar and professor at the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. She's the author of They Called It Prairie Light, the story of Shalako Indian School, Away From Home, American Indian Boarding School Experiences with Margaret Archuleta and Brenda Child, Uneven Ground, American Indian Sovereignty and Federal Law with David Wilkins, and To Remain an Indian, Lessons in Democracy from a Century of Native American Education. In this episode, Dr. Loma Wema discusses critical thinking, the doctrine of discovery, federal law, rethinking education, Shalako Indian School, resisting colonialism, trauma, surveillance, and self-determination. Thanks to awareness for the music, the interview will begin after a short jingle from a fellow Channel Zero Network member. Rebel Steps is a podcast about taking action. Season one offered insights into how individuals can join movements. Season two focuses on the ways people can work together to build these movements. Organizing in groups presents many challenges. How do you care for each other and protect each other in the midst of political struggle? How do you lift up the voices of everyone in your group? How do you work through the inevitable disagreements? All of these questions have complicated answers. As I explore these questions, you'll hear voices and stories from my community in New York City, spotlighting a range of organizers from the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, Outlive Them, Pop Gem, Democratic Socialists of America Libertarian Socialist Caucus, and more. Just like the first season, I return to Paulo Freire's quote, what can we do today so that we can do tomorrow what we cannot do today? But this time with the realization that building our capacity will necessarily happen alongside others. Find Rebel Steps on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts, and check us out on Twitter or Patreon. So uh, this first question is, it's not meant to be a linear question, but the answer may be, or maybe it's a process. I was wondering if you could explain a moment in your life when you started seeing propaganda systems in the U.S., such as in education, and seeing the, the violent system of settler colonialism as it actually is in the U.S.? Well, what a great question. You know, I think actually, although it was not at the time called settler colonialism, I, I think that kind of critical thinking for me happened really young in life in large part due to my dad, Curtis Carr, because, uh, of course, he grew up in an institution at Shalako Indian Agricultural School, one of the federal off-reservation boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he was exposed quite young to the hypocrisies, at the very least, and, and certainly the, the challenges of, you know, trying to survive in an institutional life that, that was created specifically to make Indians into something else, or at least train them to a life of subservience to authority, which he, he never responded well to. And so then he largely self-educated himself. Um, so then when, when I was a kid, and especially when I started public school, there, there was very little of anything about Native people in the curriculum at that time. Unfortunately, I don't think that's changed too much. But the stories that we heard in American history, I would come home and, you know, talk to my dad and, and my mom, too, of course. And, you know, I just I just have these memories of him very, very often saying, well, wasn't exactly that way. <laughs> and, and having conversations about that. And so I think, you know, I, I can credit him a lot with, with raising that consciousness of that a lot of what we were being taught in American history was, was mythological, that story of American exceptionalism and Native people just sort of naturally disappearing in, the, in, in confrontation with modernity and progress and all of that. Um, and, and I think the other really formative experience, I mean, my, my dad, was, who's passed now, was Creek or Muskogee. Uh, my mom came from a very small German Mennonite village in central Kansas. So when they married in 1949, that was pretty shocking, let's say, for the community she came from, although her, her folks, my grandparents, were, were just wonderfully generous-hearted, open-minded people, and they, they took my dad in completely to the family. But 
uh, the community was not quite so welcoming. And my sister and I, she's five years younger. I mean, at a young age, like age five, my folks let me stay with my grandparents every summer, which was, you know, just a wonderful, uh, they were great people. And I, I really appreciate that opportunity. But uh, as kids in that small Mennonite community, I mean, there were people there that never spoke to my grandparents again after my folks married. Uh, there were people there who certainly would not allow their children to play with us, although physically were were very white passable, especially my sister. So, you know, that was kind of a, a critical thinking education as well, to see these folks who had been in, in the community praised as being such great Christians uh, but who were really very prejudiced. Um, and I do recall my sister, one of her few friends there, was a young girl who was a Korean War baby, as they were called at the time. Uh, and and her folks were, you know, greatly praised as good Christians for taking in this poor orphan from Korea, but other folks wouldn't let their kids play with her. They certainly wouldn't let their boys date her um, when she came of high school age. So, you know, it was kind of up close and personal at that point to see the differences between um, rhetoric and reality. Yeah, and seeing those those hypocrisies as you had mentioned. Do you, do you remember if you gave teachers any pushback on on these this mythology they were teaching? What those responses were, or you know, that's kind of hard. That's kind of hard for me to remember. I uh, we and we moved around a lot in my elementary school years. We always moved in the middle of the school year. So I I was in a lot of different classrooms. I do remember when we were living around Chicago somewhere, I think it must have been a third grade classroom or maybe it was the beginning of fourth. I don't remember. I had a male teacher who was actually very responsive. So maybe I had said something earlier and just learned to, you know, stay quiet in some classrooms. But I'm, I must have said something in that classroom because he was he was very responsive and gave me a lot of rain, free rain, to to kind of try and learn and investigate things on my own a little bit, you know, whatever kind of little papers he might write in fourth grade. But I I I don't have a distinct memory of pushback and the response until junior high or middle school, I guess they call it now. I was the uh, I was an assistant to the librarian. So by this point, we're talking mid to late 60s, well, mid 60s, I guess, 68, 7, 68 maybe, and, you know, civil rights activities taking place. Mm -hmm. And we got this notification one day that the library was going to get some new books um, that would, you know, talk about an African-American and black history an experience in the U.S. And I remember saying to the librarian, well, that's really great. When do you think you might get some more accurate books for representing Native people? And she just thought that was adorable, um, kind of laughed at me and said, patted me on the head figuratively and said, well, when you write those books, dear, we'll put them in the library. <laughs> so um, some years later, after I had a few books out, I I actually sent a box to White Oak Junior <laughs> High School in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, speaking of your books, I, I wanted to to talk about your your book that you co-authored with David Wilkins, uh, mm -hmm. Uneven Ground: American Indian Sovereignty and Federal Law. And uh, you all state in this book that uh, you, we believe that the evidence clearly indicates that a great deal of Indian policy rests on a foundation of racism, ethnocentrism, repression of tribal histories, inappropriate policy making by judicial bodies, and, in, and inaccurate historical understandings. And this book is just does a great job. It clearly displays that indigenous rights are extra constitutional and that land rights were acknowledged by all colonial occupying forces in indigenous North and South America, such as Spain, France, Britain, and the U.S. And I was wondering if you could speak about the misunderstanding of the doctrine of discovery, which became precedent in Johnson v. McIntosh in 1823. And as you all mentioned, it should be considered a legal fiction, but it's been continually cited even in 2005 by the late mm -hmm. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the city of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation in New York. Mm 
And I was just wondering if you could speak about this misunderstanding and the far reaches of this precedent. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of principles of of law that have become deeply entrenched because they're just so deeply convenient. They're justifications for assertions of jurisdiction and rights to nationhood, uh, you know, on the part of the U.S. and other settler colonial nations. So, you know, that, that's the challenge, I think. If, if they justify national existence, how do you argue against them? It's, it's a pretty tough uphill battle. And I think, you know, I think what I've come to realize through, through research conducted since Dave Wilkins and I wrote that book is how much federal influence in Native lives in the U.S. actually hasn't even been implemented through law, which is at least reviewable by the courts. A huge amount of it's been through bureau- bureaucratic rules and regulations, through Department of Interior, Office of Indian Affairs. So, for example, you look at, at like in the early 20th century, when, for example, uh, Hopi men were incarcerated at Alcatraz um, because families kept their kids out of the federal school system. That was the result of bureaucratic rules and regulations. And those aren't reviewable in the courts. But the consequences of, of not following the rules and regs were certainly quite serious. And police powers were, were, police and military powers were very much operationalized and mobilized against Native resistance. And that's justified through, a, a, I think, a sort of similar principle to the doctrine of discovery, which is this idea of the federal government as a guardian, theoretically benevolent guardian of, you know, theoretically bereft Indian wards. I mean, that guardian ward thing comes out of John Marshall, 1831 Cherokee decision, um, which wasn't even a decision of the court. It was dicta because they said we can't even review this case. Um, but he made, he remarked that the re- relationship between Native people and the feds resembled the guardian ward relationship. I mean, kind of, sort of, maybe looked like. And that was so terrifically convenient, it, it almost immediately entrenched as dogma in federal Indian law and policy. So, you know, these principles, doctrine of discovery, guardian ward relationship, some interpretations of the trust relationship, they're just so doggone convenient. I, I honestly don't see, I think it's just terrifically difficult to argue against them. I mean, they have, I guess you could say, an emotional base as well as an intellectual, what people take as an intellectual rational base. To, to count, try to counter them is so incredibly threatening to national identity, U.S. national identity, and certainly to jurisdiction over lands, and it always comes down to land. It, that's, that's just one tough road to hoe. Yeah, it really starts to get to the fabric of, of the nation, of how it was mm-hmm. put into place and its contradictions, just like they've been talking about this 7076 report and how it's been damaging to the U.S. by actually looking at history honestly. And you're referring to Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think really what you're saying of the, the violence of the bureaucratic agencies as well, like with all the, the surveillance that went into the AIM movement and mm-hmm. all of the, the, you know, they had assassination programs and, and all of that and how that played out. Is that what you're speaking about? Well, really, you know, I'm thinking, and this is just, you know, an artifact of my um, interest uh, as a historian in the early 20th century, that ter- turn of a prior century, right, um, 1800s to 1900s, that's that's kind of where I tend to think about examples. But the kinds of of control over, uh, for example, you know, taking children away from parents, the lack of parental rights, which you know I think most Americans assume is a pretty fundamental right at least if you're a white person. They don't even think twice about that. The control over uh, what at the time in the uh, early 20th century were known as individual Indian money accounts, bank accounts, IIMs. Native people didn't have control over their own assets. They couldn't withdraw money from the bank without the reservation superintendent's approval. 
you know, control of land, control of resources, control of extraction of resources like oil, gas, uranium, timber, water, extraction of uh, control of leasing of native lands. I mean, all that was in in the hands of, of Interior, and a lot of that continued through the 20th century. So, so much of everyday life uh, being dictated through bureaucratic rules and regulations that, you know, Native people really had no recourse against, certainly not before Congress recognized us as U.S. citizens in 1924 and even afterwards. So that kind of control over people's everyday lives, I think, is is kind of shocking to many Americans to hear about today. Um, but, you know, a fair amount of it still continues. Thank you for sharing that. And as you say, it, it always is, goes back to land. And mm -hmm. right now people are calling on the Biden administration to shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, currently the Apache Stronghold is defending holy sites in San Carlos, Arizona. Right. I was wondering if you could talk about some current federal policy and some cases or actions you're keeping an eye on, or maybe even going back to what you're mentioning of the, the bureaucratic dangers. Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think all of us, um, keep an eye, as you say, keep an eye on those issues like Oak Flats and, uh, and the Keystone Pipeline and so on. I, I would not profess to be an expert on, on any of those issues. I kind of given my arena of, of deeper knowledge, I also am quite concerned, as, as many folks are, about the fairly, uh, what to call it, let's say fragile or vulnerable status of native languages, heritage languages, and religious practices. I mean, those have really been targeted uh, over the decades, uh, centuries, I suppose. Um, there's been some modest protections offered, for example, to, to language status through the 1990 Native Languages Act and the Esther Martinez Act that followed that. But when it comes to, you know, kind of daily practice in schools, particularly in public schools off reservation, those gains are quite uh, vulnerable in the in the place of legislatively mandated uh, testing standards like imposed through No Child Left Behind legislation, which is very, you know, a standardized achievement test oriented to to as the only thing that counts in tracking student quote unquote progress or quote unquote achievement and this seems quite impervious to any thoughts about student well-being. Um, and, and here I'm quoting my dear friend and colleague, uh, Terry McCarty at UCLA, who's, who's been a leader in the indigenous language policy movement. Certainly we've had a, an extremely chilly climate in the Supreme Court in the last 30 years or so uh, over native languages. I mean, sorry, over native religious life, you know, which once again is kind of sh shockingly antithetical to the so-called ideals of freedom of religion in this country. So, you know, there's attacks on land, um, but they're, they're linked, I think, in this whole, uh, to use your word, this whole fabric of U.S. Uh, anxiety about, I think, Native anything, because it does all come back to that notion of does the U.S. really have legally grounded, morally grounded, ethically grounded, uh, rights to the lands it calls its national territory. Uh, that's a pretty precarious position. Yeah, and um, where I live in, you know, so-called Denver or Colorado, which is homelands of Cheyenne, Arapaho, and you, the, some of the older land grants, I believe, go back to the doctrine of dis discovery from the Louisiana Purchase. So reading your book just opened my eyes even more to the the legal fiction of that. Yeah, and those fictions are, you know, as you say, they're deeply enduring. They, they're they not just artifacts of history that, oh, people could say, you know, that's in the past, get over it. <laughs> um, they're enduringly impacting lives and territories and uh, sovereignty issues today. It's, 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 it's not something that was way back when and doesn't affect people's lives today. It's, it's on the ground powerful. Well, thank you for sharing those. And um, did you just you just retired from from teaching at ASU? Yes, I did. Okay. December twenty eighth, twenty twenty. 
Wow, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I hope to have a little more time to write. We'll see. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, well, relating to that, I wanted to ask you a question about your book, uh, To Remain an Indian, Lessons in Democracy from a Century of Native American Education, which is co-authored with Teresa McCarthy. Mm-hmm. And in this book, you all talk about um, critical democracy as well as uh, some Freire and Paulo Freire, uh, some of his terms of human rights and confronting the historical and institutional roots of oppression. Mm-hmm. And you've mentioned before that, if, if I understood this right, that evolutionally we may be at the end of some epoch in colleges or education or the way we do things. Am I understanding that right? Well, having been a historian of of education broadly writ and schooling, which is, of course, one narrow little expression of of how human beings educate one another. (laughs) Yes, I have said that, that I think sometimes that that schooling as an institutional process may be an evolutionary dead end. Mm -hmm. If you take look at the long run of of human history and, uh, you know, I, I think those feelings have been reinforced or exacerbated in in this last year's catastrophe of the pandemic and, you know, schools having to go to different media, uh, online instruction and and how tremendously challenging uh, that's been and, you know, how courageous I think so many teachers have been under great duress and uh, not much of a time frame to, to learn and implement a whole new system. It's been challenging for teachers, for schools, for families, for for young people. But it, it does, I, I do wonder if it might make people kind of think about in what ways does, is school helpful and in what ways can school schools work and in what ways maybe might it be making clear what families can do um, and what the possibilities of homeschooling are, although it's, I think it's so important to say there's so many pressures and issues about who can manage homeschooling, you know, just financially, economically, families that need to have two people in the workforce and can't necessarily, I mean, that's been a tremendous challenge um, with just trying to cope with, uh, with the at-home online schooling, you know, what, what parents have the means, or grandparents sometimes, caregivers, have the means to be there and support children in that. And, and just who can't manage that so that they can still feed their families. But it does make me wonder um, the kind of what might shake out uh, from these pandemic conditions um, in maybe helping people rethink about what schooling does well and maybe what schooling doesn't do so well um, and what other possibilities um, might exist. But, uh, you know, I think, one thing about schooling in the U.S. today, it's it's such a, it's so allied to capitalist economic systems of uh, people making a living that it's it's really hard, I think, to imagine uh, the possibilities beyond school. So it, it it's not a simple equation of oh, well, schools can do this and then families can do that. Um, I mean, there's so much around that economically, financially, infrastructurally possibilities of child care and so on that that it, it's boy it's a tough nut to crack but i think that inst- some institutional structures of schooling are not so great um others i think uh, have the, at least the potential to be um to use your word liberatory and mm-hmm. and really supportive of uh, of a more equitable social arrangement in this country but yeah, if that takes so. money yeah, and I really just think that's a really important concept and question that you brought up. And I definitely have felt those anxieties, too. I, I feel that education is so rooted, traditional education is so rooted in hierarchy and domination that it really shuts down a lot, a lot of opportunities and it needs to be rethought. Yeah, and there's certainly, you know, a lot of courageous teachers and programs that that buck that trend. And, and you know, there's I think there's particularly in some of the tribally controlled schools, some of the language immersion projects and programs. There's tremendous potential there, um, tremendous possibilities, um, and and they really deserve to be uh, 
understood as models and not necessarily only models for Native people, but for other communities and families as well. But uh, it does take a tremendous investment of time, energy, labor, various kinds of resources to, to get those programs up and running and, and maintaining over time. Uh, is staying on your topic of teaching, in a, in a student review, when you were first teaching, a student said you needed to be more dogmatic or not worry so much about being subjective, possibly is what they meant. I was wondering <laughs> what advice do you have for teachers today from what you've learned? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I enjoyed my teaching career so much, and I, I feel I learned so much, but um, there was so much more to learn. Yeah, that that comment about being dogmatic. I always wondered if they knew what that word meant or what they thought that word meant. And ultimately, I guess in the ultimate self-rationalization, I took it as a compliment <laughs> that I was, I was, you know, bending over too far backward to, sh to show all sides of, a, of an issue. And, and, and it just ended up kind of being confusing for my students. At least that's how I interpreted it. So, so my response was to still try to show different sides, but to try and, and and hew a little more, a line of a little more clarity uh, in terms of where I stood. Not that they needed to agree with me, but that, you know, here's the stances on, perspectives on an issue. I, I think, gosh, I, I always feel kind of reluctant to, to advise others based on my experience because we all have different experiences, but I, I guess for myself, as, as time went on, I tried to give up early in my career some uh, the professional kind of professional development center for teaching and instruction at the University of Washington, where I had my first faculty job. They referred to this uh, phenomenon called the Atlas syndrome. You know, Atlas, the guy who carried the world on his shoulders. Oh yeah. Um, that that m many beginning teachers felt kind of had that Atlas syndrome that feeling like whatever happens in this classroom, my responsibility, it's either my fault or maybe I can take credit for it, but that's not really true. I mean, there are certain powers, I guess you could say, that, that teachers wield over students, but I think in a really healthy classroom, it's, it's so much a give and take um, that it's really about providing students with, uh, with a healthy, safe space to to learn new information, to connect it to that scaffold of information and knowledge they already have, to figure out for themselves what it means, to process evidence, to understand what, what evidence is, and kind of come to their own conclusions. And I, you know, I think I would be, I would have to say I, I had a hard time with that. I was, I was kind of bossy <laughs> and thought I could control more than I really could. So that was a tough lesson for me, it might be for others, but kind of letting go of some of that Atlas syndrome and giving people a little more room, I, I found that productive is to the degree I was able to implement it over time. I really like that. Like we don't have as much control as we think we do and making a, a nice ecosystem out of a classroom and the vibes and all that. Mm -hmm. My next question takes more into Shalako. And your father, Curtis Carr, was in the boarding school of Shalako, which was built in 1884. Yes. He was a survivor. This was a place where they had 22 bugle calls a day, but they said they were trying to promote individuality, which you showed really was not the case. So just with the sewing regulations that were so meticulously <laughs> written out. And I really love the story of where your father and the friends took the horses and the one was used to being one of the horses was used to being the lead horse, and it got out of control. Mm -hmm. and interrupted this party, the horses jumping over the tables. I love this story and the imagery. Me too. It's one of my favorites. And I was wondering if you could share some stories you've learned from your research regarding, you know, stories of human endurance or resistance or anti-colonial action at these sporting schools. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's it's. Um... I'm glad you raised that particular story because I, I think it's come to mean something very different to me over the years from when I first first heard it as a kid. And, and then even um, in 1984, when I was like officially 
interviewing my dad and other Shalako alums uh, about their experiences. You know, so my, my dad was a great storyteller, and he was a funny storyteller. I mean, he was a funny person. He was just really uh, fun-loving and great jokes and great laugh. So most of the stories that he told my sister and me growing up were, were entertaining, and they were funny stories. And really, it wasn't later, much later, um, when I was working on the, on the Shalaka Oral History Project that he said, you know, when I asked him, I guess it was in 83, Dad, what would you think about me doing an oral history of Shalako? And his first response was, oh, gosh, that's a really great idea. And, and then a little later, he said, be prepared to hear some hard stories. You know, I was really focused on, on talking to people about their school experiences. And, and some of my dad's stories, like, like that one, which I call, I think of now, I call that story the Night of the Japanese Lanterns because when those cavalry horses launched over those picnic tables, Keller, who was the disciplinarian who was holding the party, he had strung Japanese lanterns from the tree branches. And when those horses launched, um, those Japanese lantern strings caught on the boys' shoulders. And so as they pounded away in the night, those those lanterns went with them. Um, you know, that was an entertaining story, and I thought of it as kind of peripheral in a way. I mean, it was an important story about some of the of the mischief the boys got up to in their in their spare time. But I didn't really think any more deeply about it. And then for reasons I can't explain, in, in 2017, on September 28th at 4 a.m. in the morning, I just woke bolt upright, and all of a sudden different stories of my dad just came into my mind and, and I, in a very different way, and I just felt differently about them. And I thought, you know, there's there's deep meanings embedded in these stories about what it meant to grow up in this institutional setting and how students like my dad found some uh, expressions of freedom from this very regimented uh, life, a very oppressive life. And and so to me, that, that night of the Japanese lantern story to me today just really stands as a, a really important emblem of a sense of freedom for those, for those boys. Um, and, and another story that my dad shared about uh, that the boys would um, out in the spring, they would, they would go up into the squirrel nests and they would get little baby squirrels and they would keep those baby squirrels as pets. Um, and dad and his best friend, Charlie, uh, Charlie, he said was just one of the greatest hunters he never knew in his life in Oklahoma. Uh, squirrels sometimes sport this black color phase, kind of rare. And they knew where the black squirrel nests were, so they would have black squirrel babies for their pets, and that kind of set them apart from the other boys. It was something really special. And then he would talk about, you know, that you, you had to get a very young squirrel because they're wild animals after all, he said, and you can't tame them. And so the story goes on that the boys would always let the squirrels go, but when they had them, they, the little squirrel would live in their shirt pocket, shirt, shirt pocket. And I, I thought about that, how that would feel, that little warm squirrel in the shirt pocket over your heart. And they would feed them little pieces of broken up all day sucker. But they always let the squirrels go. Dad said they were wild animals after all, and you couldn't tame them. And, you know, that after years, that thought came into my mind. I wonder if that was the appeal that, you know, they could have this warm little pet over their heart for a few weeks out of a long year, and then they could let the squirrel go free. Yeah, and that, it's freedom. Yeah. But it took me a long, long time to come to that. So I, I think those stories have have many, many layers in, in, uh, of depth and possibility. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. You conducted so many interviews for for these projects. I think you mentioned it took you two years to transcribe interviews. Right. And I was wondering if you could to sh- if you could share like a transformational story or experience from just reading in the archives or conducting all these interviews, or if it also brought uh, trauma as well. Just some of the experience of that. Um, well, you know, my um, like I said, my dad had said, "Be prepared to hear some hard stories," but I didn't really. <laughs> 
And, and here I think is why. So when I had envisioned this project as a clueless graduate student, I thought, well, maybe, you know, including my dad, five or six people might be willing to talk to me and, you know, I can, I can kind of get to know them and have a series of interviews over time and, and not only talk about their experiences at Shalako, but then, you know, kind of how it played out over the rest of their life. And at least that was how I envisioned, envisioned the project. But then when I actually got to Oklahoma and started talking to people and the Shalako Alumni Association was a very, very important uh, organization that, that welcomed me and helped me with that process because, you know, students, the bonds that people made as friends in that institutional setting I mean, it was described to me so many times as, as close or even closer than, than family, siblings, brothers, and sisters. I mean, those bonds endured over life. So the Alumni Association was just an incredibly important um, gathering place for a lot of Shalako survivors. And, and I think it should be taken not so much as a, as a sign of, of loyalty to the school per se, although for some, for, for some it really was. But it was really about, you know, an expression of love and loyalty to one another. But so I get plugged into this network um, of people and, you know, they, they almost overwhelmingly felt so strongly that their stories were important and that people should know about them and that people should understand what these schools were like. They wanted to talk to me. So very quickly, that plan of, of repeated in-depth interviews with five or six people just went right out the window. And all of a sudden, I, was, I had more people to talk to than I could deal with. So it, I very quickly moved to this very, very different um, scenario of usually a, a two- to three-hour interview with a person and then on to the next person and on to the next person. So ultimately, I interviewed about 65 people in a six-month uh, time frame. But, you know, that opportunity for repeated and in-depth interviews did not just wasn't possible for me at that time. And so, you know, I, I think it's only natural, given that kind of context, that some of the darker stories, some of the more difficult stories, they just were not going to come out in that kind of a of a context. I mean, I think people were very honest. Uh, many people were very honest about the challenges um, and and how hard it was to be away from home and the ravages of homesickness. But certainly what we know existed at many of those schools, possibility of abuse in all its forms, that, you know, that simply didn't come out. And I, I think the transcription process for me, since the interviews happened, you know, in a really pretty fast, then as I sat down to transcribe, uh, I, I do recall at the time feeling like I could not actually distinguish sometimes my own personal memories and feelings from these stories that were in my head from these other people, which is a, a really strange, it's, it's a very kind of disorienting feeling. I, I wouldn't go so far as to call it traumatizing, but it was, it was certainly disorienting. And, and I think it took me some time after that to s sort of sort these stories out in my mind. And, and I think I also at that time suffered from partly a relic of my education, maybe this mythology of the, of, of the good researcher being the objective researcher, the neutral, you know, step back from it all, disengage emotionally, that particular mythology, uh, you know, which I don't subscribe to anymore. Um, but I, I, I did kind of subscribe to it then, thinking I, I need to gain some distance on this. And I'm, I'm not sure that was the right, I, I actually don't think that was correct. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> No, no, that's that's great. It has so much depth to it. So thank you. Thank you for answering that. I was wondering if, if you could you could speak about the architecture of control of boarding schools and the role that surveillance played in them and Well, they were quite remarkable. Um I mean not unusual in the structure of of, of cultural institutions. An awful lot they had in common with prisons and Oh, actually, a lot of institutions at that time, 
TB sanitariums and asylums and so on. I mean, they, they shared a lot of carceral characteristics that at least that compulsion to control uh, young people, which is in real life pretty hard to pull off. Um, I mean, total control is, is actually a pretty tough thing to, to pull off, but they did their best. Um, as you mentioned, the, that use of military discipline, uh, GI, government issue uniforms, uh, a uniformity of physical appearance, uniform haircuts, organizing people in military companies, drill every day that, that move to erase individuality, even though, even though the rhetoric of the schools was about building individualism. That was, that was practice pretty clearly put, put the lie to that. You know, I think the, the best story about the surveillance is, is about Keller, the, the disciplinarian, um, because Saturday mornings, at least if, if you had not, if you'd, if you'd not done anything bad uh, during the week and, and gotten, for the boys at least, put on punishment, list and and be working out at the rock pile as my dad said making little ones out of big ones or even for the girls uh, there were there were disciplinary assignments on saturday if, if you'd broken some rule you're polishing the hallways or some such thing but if if you know if you'd been good <laughs> you had a few hours on saturday some freedom more for the boys physically because uh, they had the run of those eight thousand acres Girls was, were a lot more physically restricted, but still they could they could get together. But uh, Keller would go up on the water tower with binoculars um, during those Saturday hours when the boys were out having fun and, and try and spy on them, keep an eye on them even then, see what they're up to in the Catalpa Grove uh, where they had their little Boy Scout camps or out in the fields and pastures where they'd go to hunt, fish along Shalaco Creek. So, you know, I think th- that level of oppressive, constant surveillance really took its toll on people. Of course, it it generated a lot of uh, resistance. It generated a lot of response among the students. How do we, you know, a lot of creativity and innovative strategies to evade that. Um, And and that's the system that those boys and girls at Shalaku called tricksing. So, you know, they lived for tricksing. Pranks, practical jokes, outright sabotage, that was a big part of school life. And, and um, I didn't hear a whole lot of it, but there was apparently a whole slang language uh, that grew up as well as kind of coded communication uh, among the students. And I, I think that's probably also not too unusual in, in those kind of institutional settings. Uh, certainly the formation of gangs uh, was a, an important part of that, important part of the social life for both boys and girls, although I don't know that the groups were always called gangs so much on the girls' side, but occasionally, certainly certainly the boys' groups were known as gangs. And, you know, that's that's a tradition we can trace back to um, uh, Omaha intellectual uh, Francis LaFleche's experience in a Presbyterian mission school in what's now Nebraska in the 1870s. He wrote a fabulous memoir called The Middle Five, Mm-hmm. Um, and the middle five was the name of the gang that, that he belonged to. So that, that certainly was an enduring aspect of those schools. You, you spoke about this topic, I believe Brenda Child has as well, about the uh, boarding school as metaphor. Along with that, kind of that term, and also with growing topics of studies on boarding schools, such as the genealogy of boarding schools, uh, looking deeper into the violent colonial schools in Guam and the Philippines. Mm-hmm. I was wondering what topics of emergent studies uh, interest you or you hope to see these studies uh, develop and grow into more. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that boarding school is metaphor. That's Brenda Child. Um, you know, and I, I think that's been one of the most, frankly, brilliant analyses of the meaning of of boarding schools, and and it and it grew out of both Brenda and I, um, and, and I'm sure other scholars as well, trying to come to grips with, you know, a historical study of the schools and interviews with people. Brenda worked with letters, uh, historical documents, you know, documenting that as, as tough as these schools were, resilient and strong young people, um, you know, made something good 
in, out of their experiences. And some people had very positive experiences there. So kind of the disjuncture between that and, and a more p- kind of public discourse about the schools as just being irredeemably destructive and, and every student a victim, you know, no good outcomes. And I think Brenda's analysis is, is just brilliant that, you know, boarding schools are metaphors. They have come to stand for, and they've been an iconic institution to stand for all kinds of violence in, in the colonial system. And, and, you know, make it, in a sense, be able for people to draw a direct line between that violence and, and bad outcomes um, in Native families and Native communities and the, and the fractures we've seen there and the uh, economic inequality and the, and the destruction of, of Native life ways and, some, and the prevalence of some, you know, some socially destructive behaviors and patterns. So it's like, you know, that fact that boarding schools are such an apt symbol of all of that um, doesn't mean that necessarily every single person who attended one was irre- 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 irredeemably destroyed. So, I, you know, I think that's a great insight on, on Brenda's part. And, I, you know, I think some of the more recent developments uh, in research that I'm really excited about, uh, one is uh, looking at the labor implications of what students were being trained for and actually the kind of labor, particularly through what's called the outing system, labor situations students were placed in, how that tied into local and regional economies, particularly in the West, women being placed in domestic labor, men in very menial agricultural labor, work gangs on on, uh, sugar beet farms in Colorado and uh, a lot of that uh, placements that were made in California and elsewhere. So those links, larger context of, of links and what it meant for Native people in the in regional economies, that's, I think, an exciting trend. Certainly, there's a growing attention, especially in the aftermath and the, of the legal cases in Canada and the ongoing truth and reconciliation processes, a greater awareness of the abuses, including sexual abuse that happen in these schools, which hasn't um, not generally speaking, been so much a part of the discourse in the U.S., a little different trajectory there, but more attention being paid to that. I think more attention being paid to schools other than the off reservation boarding schools. So there's a federal boarding, sorry, there's a federal schooling system for Native people that included boarding schools, off reservation, on reservation, but also day schools. And, you know, all of that schooling's implicated in, in overt attacks on Native social, cultural, religious, every kind of life. So I think, you know, the day schools have hardly been uh, examined yet. And that takes us right straight into a trajectory of looking at impacts of schooling through the 20th and the 21st centuries. I mean, it's now the case, I think, that it's over 95% of Native students are in public schools. They're, They're not in tribally controlled schools. A few are. Some of those public schools are run under tribal contract or tribal control, Native school boards. But, you know, the vast majority of Native kids are just in U.S. public schools. And, and what's going on there? By and large, it's things look a, a lot the same as, uh, as they might have looked 20, 30, 50 years ago. And that's not too encouraging. So, you know, I, I think that pulling that trajectory of research up through the present day, um, considering all kinds of schools and all kinds of schooling options, paying careful attention to some of the tribally or community-controlled schools that that have maintained over years, like Akwesasne Freedom School, run by Haudenosaunee people and, and a former grad student of mine, Llewellyn White, uh, has done a nice book um, about Akwesasne. I think that's kind of where I I see the exciting work developing. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And does that that come out of some of the self-determinant schools um, that started in the 60s and 70s? Yes, absolutely. And I think there's actually roots of self-determined schooling in Indian country that predate that. Um, But really, late 60s and then with with, uh, empowering legislation out of Congress, uh, fair 
some different uh, legislation that came through in the mid-70s, 1972, 1975. That's, that's really uh, opened windows and doors of opportunity that, that Native people were poised to take advantage of based on some really hard-fought moves towards self-determination earlier than that in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But the, the, the doors are kind of cracked open in the 70s and then I think get pushed hard <laughs> to open even wider by Native nations and uh, tribal communities. I was, I was wondering, I guess one of my last questions is uh, what, what are you looking to um, dig into next or, or new projects you are working on or maybe working on if you feel like sharing? Um, sure. So um, as I mentioned, I've, I've been really interested in that turn from the 19th to the 20th century and particularly in that 1924 moment when, when Congress passed what they called the American Indian Citizenship Act. A court, oh, I guess, awarded. I don't quite the right word here. Um, birthright citizenship to to American Indian people, and I've always been fascinated by like w why that moment and what was going on there. So, I've been working on a project that that's looking at that issue of citizenship and and what it meant for Native people. Um, you know, what promises it made and what promises were not necessarily delivered. I've also been uh, recently doing a little more archival research into uh, what happened to um, my dad's uh, older brother, Bob, Robert Carlisle Carr, and uh, his very brief life trajectory after Shalako. Um, he was actually expelled from Shalako for what they called incorrigible behavior and uh, then ended up in the boys' reformatory uh, in Hutchinson, Kansas, and later the state prison in Lansing. Kansas, where he passed away at a very young age. So I've been I've been um, trying to figure out uh, a little more what happened there. A very painful episode in, in our family history, and one that you know my dad was never very comfortable talking much about. So we'll see. Uh, that's that's kind of a. I mean, my work has always been very you know rooted in in family. So I feel like I've come to that a little late, but. Um, I'm I'm working on that now, but uh, the citizenship project is probably the main uh, project right now. Great, those sound those sound awesome, and the, like with your book, they called it Prairie Light. <clears throat> the narrative you have with your family is so engaging, and it just breaks open these concepts even more. I really value the work and the scholarship you do. Well, thank you. That's that's very kind of you to say so. Thank you for tuning in to the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. Thank you to Awareness for the music. Please support Dr. Loma Wema. Pick up her books, share her articles around. Please share this podcast, rate it, and if you're able, support the Time Talks podcast on Patreon.